Happy Sunday. I just returned from preaching at Sion uh, Full Gospel Church, and uh, I'm a student of Stephen Tong, so I believe in squeezism. Squeeze. It's a bit odd to finish preaching and then walk out immediately, which is what happened in the past uh, couple of weeks. And uh, the preaching actually is from 1 Corinthians 14, so it's also a good preparation for us as we move towards 1 Corinthians 14. And the part of the preaching has to do with prophecy, uh, which in a charismatic church is a very different thing from us, you know. So you get a chance to also understand their understanding of prophecies and the signs and the wonders. Uh, but for us, the Bible talks about prophecy, especially in the Mandarin translation, as preaching the word of God. And uh, I was encouraging them that it is not just about preaching the word of God on the pulpit, it's also about preaching the word of God wherever we are and prophesying in that way because the biggest prophecy of them all is that our Lord Jesus Christ will come again. And by the word of God, we know that if a person believes in Jesus Christ, there is a certain prophecy relating to the way you ought to live your life and the way your life would turn out to be based on the word of God. And that's where our emphasis on prophecy is. So I, I thank God for the uh, privilege of always being able to share his word. And this morning we want to go on with the next uh, set of verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, I want to first remind you of what was taught the last lesson. The last lesson has to do with leadership because the Apostle Paul was talking about division in the early church. Remember that I was telling you how astonished I am that there are divisions in the early church because the early church is quite different from our uh, modern day church because, you know, the early church, you have people who actually would have seen our Lord Jesus Christ physically, you know, and uh, they may have people who have been with the apostles directly, certainly the Apostle Paul, and we are not talking about your average pastor or, or preacher or evangelist here, you're talking about apostles who can resurrect the dead, which is what the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter did. So you're talking about people who witnessed for themselves all the great signs and wonders of the early church, and you would think that they would be very fired up and you really want to spend their entire life devoted to the way of the Lord, but that was not the case. There were divisions even in the early church. So there are many lessons to be learned here that we are already saved, but we are not yet made perfect, a very important part of Reformed Evangelical understanding. So do not be surprised that in any church that you attend, anywhere in the world, any denomination, whether it's charismatic, mega church, small church, big church, whatever the case may be, there will be disagreement because there's this inevitability of disagreement because of who we are. And some of the disagreements are genuine disagreement because we defer and we honestly disagree with doctrinal issue, the way we interpret the Bible. But other disagreement has to do with ego, our fallen nature, we're not happy with you, I don't like your face, I don't like the tone of your voice. But that's the kind of thing that we all live with. And so you need to accept that. Never ever find a perfect church because once you join the perfect church, it will immediately become imperfect because you too is part of the church of Jesus Christ. And of course, every one of us are imperfect. But the Bible yet commands us to be holy, to be perfect, to be united in the word of God. And from the scripture, we know that the church in Corinth was split into at least four camps. People claiming that I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter, I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Christ. And I spent a bit of time explaining where Apollos came from, an early church leader, a Jew, very articulate, very good speaker. Everybody liked to follow him because he was a, a, a very dynamic speaker. And then I went on to analyze a little bit for you the power of dynamic leadership everywhere we go in the world. And this remains true anywhere you go, that we are in an era of very prominent leadership shaping the whole world, whether it's in politics, in business, in education, every aspect of life, the prominent, charismatic, dynamic leader is now the kind of a norm for humanity. Everybody is just following all these people and the danger that uh, all these kind of uh, action will cause. And I share with you that there are at least 30,000 denominations and independent churches in the world. At least 30,000. It's very tough to figure out. Some people think there's 40,000. Whatever, you know, it's just a big, big number out there. In other words, there are many, many people who do defer on doctrines, on the style, on governance and, and all that. And surely every single one of these 30 odd thousand denomination independent church were started by an individual or a group of individuals, a key leader 
who said that, okay, we're going to stay here, we're going to go out there, and we're going to do something, we're going to form something else. You know, with this mega church uh, scandal that's going on, a lot of my unbelieving friends uh, from WhatsApp asking me, so how did this work, you know? And I say, well, you know, these people are not from the mainstream uh, church, and they don't understand mainstream understanding of the Bible. And my friends ask me, why is that the case? I say, well, every single one of the mega church leaders in Singapore were from a mainstream church, a mainstream denomination. I mean, you can go and do your research, you will find that that's the case. They were either asked to leave by the church because they kept sprouting all kinds of funny theory in the church, or they decided at a certain point in time that I cannot stay here and follow this system. I want to go out there and start my own thing. And then they went out there and they started their own system. So leadership becomes a, a, a very key issue. So then when we look at all these different divisions and all these issues, what should we do? And I recommended to you a famous uh, quotation by the Lutheran theologian in the medieval time, Rupertus Maldinius. He said that what we need to do is that when we look at a church, we look at the division, when we look at the many different differences of opinion, in essentials, we need to have unity. That means we need to be united in the essential teachings of the Bible. And we need to agree that the Bible teaches essentially these few things. But in non-essentials, we should have liberty. Non-essentials, for example, the way you want to worship. Whether you raise your hand, you wave it, whether you do different things, even as including whether you speak in tongues or not. In the Reformed Evangelical Church, Dr. Stephen Tong has spoken many times about how he would never deny that some people would speak in tongues because it's in the Bible. And so that is considered a non-essential. And you may surprise you that Dr. Tong may even use a charismatic church to do his gospel rally. And he has done that before, borrowing the premises of a charismatic church that is very large to do gospel rally. And I think recently in Manila, he did a huge gospel rally in collaboration with a church that is not a traditional reformed evangelical kind of a church. So those are the non-essentials. You need to have liberty, meaning you allow or you accept that people have a different opinion in these things. For example, baptism. Today we are happy day. We have many people who are going to be baptized. They will be baptized by sprinkling. So in a Reformed Evangelical Church, we are inclusive. We, we include sprinkling and immersion. Immersion means your entire head go into the water. To do that, you usually go to a swimming pool to do your baptism. Or in Singapore, they go to East Coast, the sea, you know. That's a lot troublesome because it's very salty, the water. And uh, what will happen later on, you will find that all the kids will be screaming, the babies, uh, about, we have eight, like, eight babies <laughs> that is going to be, be baptized today. And, and praise God. But it's quite fascinating to watch later on, you will know. It's very noisy. <laughs> and uh, parents always try very hard to keep the kid calm and, 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 and go through the whole worship service. But when the baptism comes and Dr. Tom pour water on the kid's head, the kid will suddenly scream. It's always like that. And then you have this whole chorus of screaming babies everywhere. And to, be in, to have liberty means that we accept both immersion and sprinkling at the same time. And we can co-work with the Baptist. I served in the Baptist church for many years uh, without being re-baptized. They want me to be re-immersed because they say my first baptism don't count. So in this area, we have liberty. But no matter what happens, in all things, charity means that when you discuss issues like that, remember love. Don't go around with a giant hammer and flatten people just because you disagree. When you approach all these issues, you must have love in your heart. But of course, the key question is, what are the essentials? So that's where the problem is. That some people think of the essentials and non-essentials, or they think that the non-essentials are the essentials, and they are very hung up about stuff like that. And you need a lot of wisdom to know. And the Apostle Paul here pointed out some of the essentials, which is that Jesus Christ is not divided, and that the baptism of Paul, they are not essential. Obviously, the people back then were arguing about this. People were boasting that they have been baptized by the Apostle Paul. And Paul says, was Christ divided? Was Paul the one who was crucified for you? Uh, was, you know, what, what was the baptism of Paul? And he pointed out very carefully that the essentials would definitely include Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. And that's where verse 17 ends. The Apostle Paul says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And that's verse 17. And so following verse 17, then we move into 
18 to 25 following the same trend of thought where the essentials are being focused squarely on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where we will be going uh, for this morning's sermon. Let's come to God in a word of prayer and commit the time into His almighty hands. We thank you, God, for leading all of us here this morning. We pray, O oh God, that our hearts will be open towards you, that we will be teachable and we will hear your word. And we will hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us in our hearts, that we are willing to submit completely to him and model our entire life based on Christ crucified. Have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our hearts and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight. For you are our God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now whenever we come to the Bible and whenever we read the Bible, very often for those of us who have been Christians for a long, long time, it seems to be the most obvious thing, you know, that the Bible talks about the cross of Jesus Christ, the Bible talks about the gospel, Jesus died for us. We look at it and we say, yeah, sure, that's the case. Especially for those of us who have been brought up in church, you grew up in church, like our kids in the room, you know, they have been taught. I, I don't know whether you know this or not, we have very, a group of very dedicated Sunday school teachers from the toddler all the way to the adult Sunday school. In toddler Sunday school, they, they, they put up songs, they practice and if I'm not mistaken, they teach them things that are related to Westminster, very serious that kind of stuff. So you want to bring out your kid in the Lord. And so after a while, you may think of this as, well, of course, that's the case. But actually, if you look at the Bible carefully and you look at the rest of the world around us, you will find that the message we preach is a very strange message, a message that is very difficult to understand. So the Apostle Paul wants to emphasize that the cross of Christ has great power. And so in verse 18, he said, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So what exactly is the word of the cross here? The whole passage is going to be focused on this whole idea about the word of the cross. When you say the cross of Jesus, what does it mean? A lot of people are talking about the cross of Jesus. I mean, everywhere you go, you go to the mega church, you go to a charismatic church, you go to a conservative church, people talk about the cross of Jesus Christ. They're always upon the cross. And you sing hymns or different kind of songs like the one you just sang, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory forever. What exactly does that mean? It is not just about that physical cross of Jesus Christ. And by the way, uh, a lot of cultural influence uh, with us, when we think about the cross of Jesus Christ, we typically think about it in like a small letter T kind of a concept, right? Uh, but historically speaking, Jesus Christ could have been crucified on an X shape kind of a thing or a capital T shape kind of, of, of a structure. Uh, some people believe he was nailed to a tree instead of a cross cross. And so some in some of the more olden day hymna, you will hear, you will sing about how he was hung on a tree kind of a thing. So it's not just about the symbolism only, but a lot more than that. When you use the word of a cross, you are saying that the, we are preaching a message that the time of the Lord has come. There are all these struggles, all these looking for God, all these trying to find a solution for the world, by the entire world in history, has come to an end because Jesus Christ has appeared. That's part of the word of the cross. That the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ fulfilled that promise and the, the prophecy of God. That the solution given to us is here. And it is to be found in this person called Jesus Christ. It's not just about him hanging on the cross alone, but his entire existence, his entire life, his teaching, his lifestyle, what he has taught us to be the truth of God. These are all the words of the cross, which finally culminate in him giving up his life for us, hanging on the cross. It didn't end there, because right after that, the resurrection occurred. And not only that, the idea that Jesus Christ will come again. So this morning when I was speaking about prophecy, I said, as senior pastor I pointed out many often, that prophecy is not just about whether you will win 4D this week. It was a number out there. My friend just sent me a, 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 a note and said that he found this product. It's kind of a bean. You, you plant the bean and then the, the plant grew up and then there will be a bean that comes out with it and there's four numbers on it. Anybody bought that kind of thing before? You know, and, and, and the idea is that you can also have words like I love you or 
I hate you or whatever it is, put on the bin. So 4D. And when it's a 4D number, everybody gets very excited. So that's prophecy. No, pro the biggest of them prophecy is that Jesus Christ will come again and the word of the cross includes that man can be saved simply by putting faith on the fact that Jesus Christ died for you and is willing to bear your sin for you and is resurrected. So the whole idea and the whole message of Jesus Christ is put in three words, the word of the cross. So do not just confine your idea about, oh, whether do you believe that Jesus Christ was crucified for you? It's not so simple. It's the entire idea of how God will come and give us a solution through Jesus Christ and the most significant event of them all will be Him crucified and resurrected. And so when the Bible talks about the word of the cross, it's referring to the entire understanding of what it's all about. For those of us who have been in church for the longest time, it's like, yeah, sure, of course. It's like, okay, yeah, I know, I understand. But it's actually a concept that is most difficult. As the Apostle Paul says, the word of the cross is folly, which means that it's stupid. It doesn't make any sense to those who are perishing. Dr. Stephen Tong shared an example. He said that of all the places to have gospel release, there are some countries that are particularly difficult. Japan will be one country where the gospel of Jesus Christ has been preached for a long time by missionaries and yet only a very tiny percentage of the Japanese uh, have decided to become Christians. And the other place is Thailand. That it is most difficult to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in Thailand. Dr. Seven Tong said that once he attended a gospel rally as a guest and, uh, you know, and, and there were people who were preaching about how Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross for the sins of the mankind, which is something that we will preach, of course, by the word of God. And Dr. Tong said that he observed that the Thai's audience were sniggering, laughing, or, or making jokes about it. And, if he, and, and he couldn't understand why they would do that because, you know, he has preached in so many hundreds and thousands of gospel rallies before. And he said that, wow, you know, it's a very strange thing that when the speaker was describing the pain and the suffering of Jesus Christ, that people would laugh about it among the audience. So he went to ask his Thai host and said, why is this the case? And the Thai host said, well, you know, as far as the Thai is concerned, this guy who is hanging on the cross must have done something terrible. And it's his karma you know, as in Thai Buddhist understanding of life, that he deserves it. He has done something terrible and so he's humiliated hanging on a cross. Of course, that's the problem. He has done wrong and so he deserves it. And so for the Thai, it is completely not possible or very, very difficult for them to transcend that understanding, to think that someone will die for you for your sin. And last year's Visa Day in Singapore, there was a huge coverage in a newspaper in Straits Time. And the journalists went around asking very devout Buddhists, including some people who are ministers in Singapore, why did you choose to become a Buddhist? And a lot of the people who were interviewed said, because I don't believe that someone should take on my sin. I don't. I believe that I have to be responsible for my own life. I need to solve my own sin. And so Buddhism... It's about that, right? Buddhism is a, a kind of a plus and minus, a zero-sum game kind of a faith. You do something, you need to cover it with good deeds, with repentance and all that. So it's just a plus and minus all your life. If you have done something uh, terrible in your previous life, you're going to pay for it in this life. And if you want your next life to be better, you better do something good in this life. And they have a complete system like that. For all the sisters who are sitting among us, you, for example, you spend all your life, you do all good deeds, you let go of birds and fish during Visa Day, and you help the auntie who is selling tissue paper, and you help all these people all your life long. In your next reincarnation, guess what you will become? Do you know? You will become a man. That's your reward. You know, that's a kind of reincarnation kind of a concept. So you work very hard in your lifetime for the sisters, you become a man. And for the men, if you work very hard, maybe you become a Buddha Vista. So if you messed up your life and all that, in your next lifetime, you become a woman. La. Hello, your sum's not very good. You know, if you're even worse, you can become a dog or cat or whatever it is. If you are a butcher, you kill a lot of pigs, then chances are you become a pig. So it is a, a very logical and easy to understand concept. And that accounts for some of the popularity of the faith as well because you are saving yourself. So why should I believe that someone out there somewhere 
will be taking on my sin. So for Christians, yeah, you know, of course, but for people who are perishing, as the Apostle Paul says, it is something most strange and something most weird to understand. But I want you to take note that over here, the Apostle Paul is talking about a design, a black and white situation, that there is a group of people who are perishing, who will look at the message of the cross and say, this doesn't make sense. You know, it really is a crazy idea. And the other side of the coin is, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So there are two bipolar kind of reaction to the cross of Jesus Christ. Why is that the case? Verse 19 gives us the answer. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. The Apostle Paul quoted from Isaiah chapter 29, verse 14, a prophecy by the prophet Isaiah quoting God himself. And the question then was asked, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? In verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. So herein lies a, to me, pretty frightening and horrifying fact. And that fact is that God planned for his message of salvation to be rejected by the fallen world. That it is by planning or by the will of God, as the Apostle Paul stated, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save only those people who believe. And this is a very classic Reformed evangelical understanding that every single one of you who truly belong to the kingdom of God belong to the kingdom of God because it pleased the Lord. Because by the wisdom of God, He picked you. And this is one thing, as I've always preached, that is most difficult to understand and most profound as well. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians that it is something that has been decided even before the world was founded. And you want to wrap your mind around that concept, you can't. How does it work? How is it possible that before the world was founded, God already knew who you are and by His wisdom and by His own pleasure that He has picked you out of the billions of people in the world. And this is something which is most difficult to understand. And my own conviction is that the more you understand this, the more you understand how privileged we are to be called children of God. And the more you understand that privilege, the more you understand that you ought not to live your life in the way that you choose, but you ought to think about what God wants out of your life and what is the purpose of this all. And of course, by design of God Almighty as well, the fallen world has lost the ability to reach God. And so when we look at the mess that the world is in, do not be surprised. The Bible has a very pessimistic view about the future of mankind and that the future of humanity will continue to deteriorate until one fine day our Lord Jesus Christ will return. This, in contrast with Buddhist understanding, very different, you know. Many people do not know this, but in Buddhist teaching, the world will become better and better and better. They too have a messianic kind of a concept. Remember that Buddhism actually is a concept without God. They believe that every person has the potential to become the enlightened one, the name Buddha means the enlightened one, the one who has reached Navada, who has thought it true and is enlightened. So the idea is that every single person can be a Buddha. And the idea in Buddhism is that one fine day, another key Buddha will appear, like a Messiah kind of a thing. And then all peace and goodness will come to the existing world. And so our concept is drastically different. Because by the prediction of the Bible, the world will continue to reject him. The world will continue to go down the toilet. And finally, Jesus Christ will come again. But as you can see in the verse, by the wisdom of God, the world would not know God through its own wisdom. And by design of God, that is the way it is. And God has deliberately chosen a message that the fallen world would not understand. But from another angle, simply because you are fallen, 
you will not understand God anyway because of your fallen state. And so Dr. Stephen Tong has named our movement the Reform Evangelical Movement. In English, it doesn't sound too big because there is also the Evangelical Reform Movement. But in the Chinese translation, it is better. The Chinese word for our movement is called the Gui Zhen Fu Ying Yin Tong. The word Gui Zhen in Chinese means to return back to orthodoxy, to return back to the way God meant everything to be. And that's what Gui Zhen means. It's not just reform. The word reform has historical meaning. It, it, it has this whole idea that you are reformative, you are changing, you are becoming better. But Gui Zhen is better. Gui Zhen is that you go back to how God has designed everything to be. And so one of the reasons why the world would not understand this is because you are not Gui Zhen. You are somewhere else. You are not under the correct understanding of how things should be. And that's why you got it all wrong. And so the question is, are you upside down or are you the right side up? When you are upside down, the entire world will look wrong to you. But the problem is that you are the one who is upside down, not that the world has gone upside down. So these are some of the key things that create a situation where the message of the cross is folly to the fallen world. But to those people who are right side up, who are correct and right, they recognize it because the Holy Spirit has made their heart right. And their entire life, slowly but surely, will go back to the correct position that God has wanted us to be. But it's a very, very tough thing to do. So I always use the word 1,001 voices because there are so many people in the fallen world that are influencing us. So many messages. In verse 22, the Apostle Paul mentioned about his challenge at his time, which is still the same for us today. For the Jews demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. So two major obstacles is found. Four means because. Why is it that the fallen world cannot see us? The Apostle Paul says there are at least two reasons. Number one, the Jews demand signs. The Greeks seek wisdom. So number one, signs. What does the fallen world want? The fallen world want external demonstration of power and strength. And the Jews of his time were the ones who demonstrated this the most. And so the Jews want to see signs. They want to see miraculous signs. And in the days of Jesus Christ, there were many other messiahs that were around. I think there were at least 108 people who claimed that they are the Messiah. How do you know that they are Messiah? I can demonstrate sign to you. I can show you great power and great ability. And the world is fixated on that kind of idea. The external idea that there is strength and there is power. And the Jews like that. But Jesus Christ did not do that. For Jesus Christ's sake, he was the other way around. You know, he was born in poverty, not only had no place to, to stay, he has to go get a place for men for the animals. And if you do any historical study, the manger is not like your Christmas manger, right? Uh, I did this morning in this church that I went to preach in, they put up a little manger thing with lights, and then the sheep and the cow, very cute, and then the Mary is very clean, as if, you know, everything is just washed yesterday, and baby very cute, and the hay, very nice, little angel lights everywhere, and then there's a, that's a typical manger thing. If you go to the history of the early church, the manger probably is just a cave hole, where animals live, right? There are no angel lights, there's no hay, whole place must stink sky high, and the place where Jesus Christ was born probably is a trough where they used to feed the animals, like a, like a kind of stone thing where you, you pour feed and an animal will come and then they make do with it and then that, that's it, you know, it's like the smelliest thing under the sun. And Jesus Christ was born like that. And all his life, he led a life of suffering, of poverty. He said that the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, you know. And they do that and they were walking by a field they can be so hungry that they will pluck out the grains on the field and, and eat it and the Pharisees got upset. So that shows you that, you know, he really led a life that was most difficult. And the Jews cannot accept that because by their understanding, power must come with a Messiah, with a king. The guy who's going to save us, surely he has some power. Till today, that is the case too. Dr. Stephen Tong always point out that all the code of national arm of the entire world has to do with power. The, the things that you pick to, 
to represent your country must be power. Let me test your current affair. The top left, what is that? Which country? Hey, give me some hope. Lah. Come on. I know you study geography and all that kind of thing. Which country? Don't know. Really? Huh? India. Three lion. The one in the middle. Please tell me you know this. <laughs> Which country? Indonesia, lah, of course, right? It's an eagle. Uh, there is still eagles in Indonesia or all of them kind of hunted to extinction already. You know? What kind of eagle? I don't know. Mythical eagle, Garuda. Garuda, right? It's a mythical eagle. The one on the right, do you know? Anybody? If you know, I give you a free lunch. <laughs> Which will happen afterwards, by the way. Kenya. It is the symbol of Kenya. Two lions. Now, in the middle of the shield, and that's the Maasai warrior shield and the two Maasai spear, uh, the depiction is a rooster. So it's hey, so horrible. Use the rooster as a national symbol. Yeah, but the rooster is carrying an axe. You can chop your head off kind of a, a thing. So there's still power there, right? And then, of course, the bottom uh, left is the American symbol, which is a very warlike symbol. So on the one hand, it carries the oil leaf, uh, leaf of peace, but on the other hand, the thunderbolt arrows of war. So the typical American style, like you either surrender or kill you, kind of a thing. And then the eagle is holding on to a Latin phrase, which says, out of the many comes one. So it's the United States of America, out of the many comes one. And then after that, which country is that? Bottom middle. Malaysia, that is flanked by two. Tiger, and the bottom right, of course, is the Singapore National Corps of Arm. It has two animals on it. One is the singa, which is lion. On the right is a tiger. Anybody know why the tiger is there? Do you know? Ayo, we feel national education. <laughs> Anybody? Why, why is there a tiger on our national? Why not two lions? Huh? Yeah, because we are saying that we cannot escape from Malaysia. So the tiger is always there watching us. <laughs> it symbolizes a forever symbiotic relationship with Malaysia. Uh, despite the fact that they always threaten us with cutting off our water and all that kind of thing and raising the toe or whatever. This is a national symbol to show you that you cannot escape from Malaysia. But all these are power symbols, right? And like Dr. Tong said, you won't find a country that used the gazua as the national symbol or a cockroach or a chick or something like that. I think I was... I was curious as to what he said, so I, I kept looking and looking and looking. I think the most humble one would be Grenada. They use the Amadelo, which is a little... Uh, but the Amadelo has armor and all that, you know what I mean? And then on the right of the Amadelo is some kind of bird. Uh, so sometimes it's a national bird or whatever it is. But all of them must have some things to brag about, lah. You know, I think the French symbol is the chicken or rooster or, or something like that. So you really make fun of it with the chicken. They are all chickens. Um, and, and, but you want this whole idea that there is power and there is strength. And so the Jews seek after that. Then of course not only the Jews seek after that, more all of humanity seek after the external display of power and glory as the thing that we think is a sign of God's blessing or God's power. I can tell you with my entire life's testimony that it is extremely difficult to escape from the idea that a bigger house, a bigger car, a bigger whatever it is, a more bubbling, bubbling in your life, kaching, kaching in your life, means that you are powerful, that you have arrived, that it is something that is great, and that's the way it is. And it is extremely difficult to escape from that. I will tell you that for as long as I have lived, I have battered and I won't use the word struggle, but I have faced challenges relating to this line, whether it is my peers, whether it's my relative, the people I know, people who are close to me, including, by the way, church people. It would seem that everybody is measuring everything from their anger. Recently, I got a chance to go to Sentosa Cove, and I don't know whether you know this or not. The next time I go on TV, I think I will go and challenge the authorities. There's this big, huge... Oh, before I go on, anybody living in Sentosa Cove? 
don't have right yeah okay but this is huge piece of paradise in singapore one of the best kept secret in singapore in sentosa cove and and people like me when you want to enter into this whole secluded area the security guard will block you first right like who the hell are you why are you here you know oh, i'm here to deliver something okay delivery man come you fill in this form deliver okay go go so because i'm a delivery man so i can go in to deliver something and when i went in i was so surprised you know it is this huge place with a lot of rolls royce and fast cars whose name i cannot pronounce and and they have their own set of rules. For example, you're not supposed to park your car on the side of the road. Uh, if not, the security will come and go after you. I noticed that the roads are all very well paved. Even the grass are like carpet grass. And then you have all this sculpture. And we're not talking about just one condo thing. We're talking about a whole kind of a small little peninsula that they built up from nowhere, I suppose. I'm just wondering whether it is right for taxpayers' money to be used in such exclusive manner. So much so that poor lawyer citizen like me has to say that I'm a delivery man before I can enter into that place. You know, can I just like walk in and and I don't know sit on the side of the curb? Is, is that something that's allowed? So there's exclusivity there, and you feel very poor when you are there, right? And we know in the newspaper that one of the condos there, the monthly rental is thirty four thousand Sing dollar. Thirty four thousand. Saying dollar, that's more than annual pay of many of us, right? And and you have that kind of exclusivity. Why would that be the case? Why? Why why is their beaches better than other East Coast beach or whatever it is? Because the idea is that with power comes success and that's the way it is and, and that's the way life is. It's extremely difficult to escape from that. So much so that it has influenced Christianity, of course, and we are all well aware of the things that has happened recently with the City Harvest Church and the sentencing. And it is such a big fat mess, isn't it? I always use the word mess. The idea that Jesus Christ has died, and this whole idea that he has died in such a terrible and poor manner, this poor Jesus Christ, doesn't make sense, man. Come on. Oh, so therefore, we sort of change our idea and we say that, okay, he died to give you gifts. He died to give you prosperity. He died to give you health and wealth and all things good. And the mess continue, you know. And uh, this uh, Kong Yi was writing in his Facebook that he's saddened by the length of the jail term. And immediately, so many people posted in the Facebook that, yeah, we are very saddened too. That is so short. Can it be longer? It's like, ooh, you know. It's so terrible and the whole thing is such a big fat mess that it's very difficult to figure out what is the actual impact on the Church of Jesus Christ today. So you see the whole idea that everything has to do with the way the world understands success to be ought to be the way, even for people who have studied the Bible and want to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's nothing new, you know, by the way. Many years ago when I was a bit younger, one of the flavor of the month was this thing called the prayer of Jabez. Have you heard that before? The prayer of Jabez. Some guy went to dig out a verse from First Chron Chron Chronicles chapter four, verse ten. This guy called Jabez, and he, by the way, the name only appeared once in the Bible, in like two lines. Jabez says, "Oh God, will you prosper me and my territory, so that I, I I can glorify your name?" Along that kind of a line. And this fellow wrote a book on the prayer of Jabez and said, Ah, you see, the Bible tells us that we can ask God to prosper us if by prospering us, it means that it will make us more able to help the poor and the, the people uh, who are poor. And, 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 and that's what Jabez do. And so Jabez was prospered uh, by God. The Bible says, and God granted what he asked. That's all. And so this fellow wrote a book and said, All you have to do is ask God to prosper you. But in order to prosper you, uh, you must tell God that if you prosper me, I will prosper other people too. I help people. I mean, for me to help people, I must have money, right? If you don't have money, how do I help anybody else? I can't what? I can't even survive myself. How do I help people? So yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So the whole world swam into the Prayer of Jabez movement and everybody had this Prayer of Jabez book, Prayer of Jabez uh, poster hanging all over the place. Everybody is calling out to God that just as Jabez did, I'm asking you a lot to prosper me. Expand my territory, Jabez says. Enlarge my border that your hand might be with me and that you will keep me from harm. And it's legitimate. 
and people like it. Who wants to suffer? Doesn't make sense whatsoever. So the message of Jesus Christ on the cross doesn't make sense to those of us who are inspired by signs. And I'll tell you that a high percentage of us belong to that category. And the Apostle Paul then went on to the next group of people. The Greeks seek wisdom. And wisdom is the other way around. It is a demonstration of intellectual power and strength internal to us. So the external are the people who seek for signs. They think that they are more crass. They think they are more worldly. But the Greeks seek for wisdom. And of course, we are all influenced by Greek philosophy today in one way or the other. And Dr. Tong is an expert in this area. When the Apostle Paul wrote this, the Greeks actually had at least 50 schools of philosophical thought, of significant ones, not the tiny, tiny one, of significant one. That means there are many people who try their best to figure out the wisdom of life. How do you live life? What you should do? What, how you should, for example, treat your marriage? your children, parenting. There's so many 1,001 voices out there that tells us how to move. But it is not unusual, actually, especially for the, the Chinese, because the Chinese in its history always had the same kind of understanding as the Greek did. And you seek after different philosophy. In China, there is a word called Zhu Zi Bai Jia, which in a loose translation is multiple school of thought, especially before the Qing dynasty during the time of the warring state. There are many, many teachers out there. Now, we are all very familiar with Confucius. That's about it, you know. But those of us who are more bicultural know that other than Confucius, there's Zhu Zi. Zhu Zi means many teachers. The word Zi means teacher. So you have Zhuang Zi, Lao Zi, Kong Zi, Meng Zi, Sun Zi, Mo Zi, many, many of them. And every one of them propose a different philosophy in life and how you should move. And then because of that, you have different school of thought too. You have Taoism, Confucianism, from Mo Zi come Mohism and Legalism, Fa Jia, and that's where they, they talk about how laws should be more important. Naturalism, uh, Agriculturalism is about how the farming world gives us the wisdom to live life. Militarism, how military is might. And so there were a period of time in China before the Qing dynasty came where there were like hundreds of different kind of philosophy as how to live life. And then Qing Si Wang came and then uh, destroyed them all. And Qing Si Wang hit the Confucianists the worst. And so he killed many of these scholars. But the point is that throughout the history of mankind, many, many people seek to have wisdom. Anyone who find the way forward. And other than there are people who seek after money, big car, big house, big everything. But there are also many people who seek after the way to live life. I mean, you walk into any bookstore today, there are a lot of self-help section. I'm quite surprised some of my classmates wrote some of these books. I was like, hey, the guy was kind of stupid, right? How come he can write a book? You know, it's like nowadays anybody can publish a book. You realize that a lot of them publish their own, using their own money. You know, and it's, it's a loss-making thing. And if you publish a book just to say that, hey, I was a book publisher. You know? So I have friends who wrote books about how to live life. And it's like, wow, okay, they know how to live life. So many different theories. When we look at the Bible then, what are we talking about here? The wisdoms of the world, the science of the world, the Apostle Paul says this means nothing. So much so that Pastor John MacArthur Jr. says that he did believe that you shouldn't study philosophy in school or in the university. Anybody philosophy student here? Ah, oh, okay, well, I better be very careful what I say. John MacArthur said you shouldn't study philosophy. Why? He said if philosophy is right, it, it will fulfill the word of God. So why bother? It is the word of God. If philosophy is wrong, it's against the word of God anyway. So why bother to study? Well, I wouldn't be that extreme because I know that the philosophy is a training of the mind to, to look at the issue and even the word of God uh, and to think about it from a, a critical angle. And that is fulfilled the way God has created us to give us a reasoning mind. So that's a good thing. But if you were to find the solution from philosophy and from the wisdoms of the world, that's where Paul says it cannot be done. Because the Jews seek for external signs, the Greeks want to figure their way out for God, towards God, just like the Buddhists do, but they're not going to figure their way towards God. They're figuring their way towards enlightenment. Your own effort, the Apostle Paul says, that's not going to work. 
it's not going to work. And this is folly for people who understand that. For us, the Apostle Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. And when you preach Christ crucified, again, I remind you, it's not just Him on the cross, but the entire gospel message, it is a stumbling block to the Jews who want to look for signs. And it is a folly to the Gentiles who think that I must be the one who think it true. And that's the way the rest of the world function. When we preach a Jesus Christ, the way the Bible says, He is, and His message, those who look for signs will say, that cannot be, right? He is so weak. He is hanging on the cross. Even His garment is taken away from Him. You know, Dr. Tong has mentioned this many times, that he believed that Jesus Christ was crucified naked. I think so too. But in medieval art, he always have a loincloth and all that, right? That is just to give him modesty. But by Roman tradition, he was because it's a complete humiliation for him. So how can someone like that save me if you are looking for science? And then if you are a person who look, look for philosophy and wisdom of the world, you ask yourself, how does it work? This whole, whole idea about God coming, dying for us, does that make sense at all? But for those who are called, both the Jews and the Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So again, a clear segregation between those who are called by God and those who are not. And this is classic Reformed evangelical understanding. For those of us who truly belong to God, there is a mystical, supernatural kind of a state that is very difficult to explain to people who do not understand. Because the whole message of Jesus Christ is completely upside down compared to the message of the world. And I will tell you that this is not the case only in the New Testament, but implicitly throughout the entire Bible, the methods of God, the wisdom of God is completely different from the wisdom of man. I have given to you the second responsive reading passage from 1 Samuel chapter 17. This very familiar passage about the young David attacking Goliath. And exactly as Brother Michael said earlier, a lot of the simple message that people will get is that, oh, you know, this is an illustration of how you can defeat the giants of your life. You know, how to become a better person, make more money because you can overcome whatever weaknesses. Look at David and Goliath. La, la, la. I return to the passage very often to read about this particular thing that David has said. And that is found in verse 45. Uh, and this is a classic example. Now, you, you, you got to think through this very carefully. Here you have Goliath, a person who is big and strong. And there you have David, a young shepherd boy. Uh, maybe only about 16 years old, you know, by historical account. Verse 45, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Then David said to the Philistine, which is Goliath, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. This is the science of the world, isn't it? You come to us with a sword, with a weapon, with your machinery, with your blinks, with your car, with your power, with your money, with everything that you have. All this power. And it's frightening too. I don't know whether you've ever been in the presence of the ultra-rich or the ultra-powerful. Have you ever been in the presence of Li Kuan Yu, for example, the power that exudes from him, right? It's this kind of a build-up, you know, assuming that Li Kuan Yu wants to come here. The first thing that will happen is that a team of people will come here with mirrors. They will check beneath every chair to see whether you stick anything underneath the chair. After that, dogs will appear. For what purpose? To sniff whether there's any explosive and all kind of thing. And then you'll be instructed what to do. And he comes in and everybody's in awe. They say, oh, I should have washed my hair. I should have wore better. You know, because it's Lee Kuan Yew. You know, he appears as his power. Or the very rich, the ultra-rich. If you have been with the ultra-rich before, you know, wow, you know, these guys, people are so rich that even their shark fin soup tastes different from the normal type because... Who knows? Maybe it's a fresh shark that just came out yesterday. And I've been invited to one of these places in the outer reach. For the first time in my life, I ate durian without touching the durian. It's because someone is doing everything for you. And then 
I guess it's a, one of the tricks is to watch what other people do, right? Because, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people where you sit down there and there's so many spoons and you don't know what to do, right? And so one of the tricks is to watch what people do. So when the durian come, I notice everybody take out a spoon. <laughs> you know, I felt like taking it squat on the floor and eat. That's the best way to eat durian, right? You know, but, you know, my wife said, don't do that. Don't do that. Use the use a spoon so like a power that comes upon you you come to us with sword and a spear and a javelin and David said I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defiled this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and I will cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with the sword and spear, for the better is the Lord, and he will give you into our hand. And that is why David is considered a man after God's own heart. Last week, Dr. Tong was not well, and so they, they tell me that uh, maybe you need to speak on his behalf. And so he was exhausted, and so uh, in his room he was sleeping. And so I went down earlier to prepare. And because he has been preaching in, about the Psalms, I don't want to preach about the Psalms. I wanted to talk about the life of David. I was quickly checking through and including these verses, checking through and, and all that. So it recalls the, the person he is. Uh, but right before I went up to speak, suddenly he appeared like magic, you know. And that's like, the, who knows how many times. Every time they ask me to take over his place, he will appear suddenly. Maybe that's one of the tricks. Whenever he's sick, just say that Yong Temeng is going to take over and God will raise him. <laughs> just in case Yong Temeng will speak on his behalf. Let's, let's even talk, take over, you know. But this particular passage shows us the heart of David. Not only that, it is a demonstration of the way of God. That God would use a way that we look at and say, this is crazy, man. How would this stupid little kid be able to go up against the sword and the javelins and the, the weapons of the world? And David had that understanding that it is by the power of God Almighty, not by the signs or the thinking processes of the world that say this is impossible, but by the word of God. And so this passage is a passage that I go back and read often, very often. I am encouraged all the time that a young David would have been given that kind of understanding. Yeah, he was not perfect. He committed adultery and murder, and that's another lesson altogether. But that he had that pure understanding of how God works. So when the Apostle Paul says, we preach Christ crucified, what exactly is he talking about? A stumbling block to the Jews and the folly to the Gentiles. He is talking about us preaching the suffering servant Jesus Christ, not the rich Jesus Christ that got this other church into big trouble. Got it completely wrong because Christ crucified is about the suffering Christ, the Christ who came, who teach us love, humility, service, and sacrifice. That Jesus Christ crucified, that way of God whom the world look at and say, this is impossible, this is stupid. Why do I want to spend my life loving people and being humble and being serving other people and having a sacrifice? It's all about me. We preach a message of truth that the world simply cannot recognize. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that is the Christ that we understand. You know, if you ask me what my job is as your pastor, my job is to bring you to that Christ that you understand that He is Lord over your life. That by yourself, you understand that you are the church. That you are to adhere to everything that He said, not everything that I say. It really frightens me and chill, sends chill down my spine to know that there are still 17 over 1,000 people who doesn't quite understand what has happened in City Harvest. Do you know that by now, we have not heard a single admission of guilt? None. It is just a whole question of, well, we pray together, we move forward. By God's grace, we will move. None. Nobody has said that we have done wrong. None. Nobody has said that we better pay back that Roland guy who, who was the first to blow the whistle and say something is wrong because they asked us to buy all these CD. You know, they make him pay thirty-three over $1,000 to put up an ad in the Straits Time to apologize. And he was wrong. Wrong ED by the church. 
Nobody has said that we have done wrong, that we need to apologize, that we need to go back and say that we need to repent of our sin. And the world is just upside down. And the problem is because you listen to someone with a glib tongue who is smooth, who, who put up great signs and wonders and, and are able to show you the sign. And it may not be the sign that the Jews have, but it's a different kind of a sign, you know. I was just showing Patricia. That they, you know, they, they were like standing on the stage and the background is this LED kind of a huge screen, high resolution, and it was like autumn forest background, all red autumn leaves, you know, that kind of thing. I said, like, wow, this is so nice. You know, and with huge LED screen that project the, the face of the leaders right into your face. That kind of a sign. Is that what my job is, to, to use all these kind of things to promote myself and to promote a certain idea that is not from the Bible? The answer is no. So my job is to bring you to the Word of God that you understand that you too is humble to Han. You are servant of God in a different capacity, that you by yourself follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I am one of the shepherds, but my job is to lead you to the big shepherd, the greatest shepherd of them all, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. And the message that he has brought is a difficult message, tough. And I will tell you in no uncertain term, as the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, if you are determined to follow this Jesus Christ and determined to live a life that is consistent to the word of God, you will be persecuted. You will be challenged. Your peers, your loved one, your relatives, the people closest to you, even your spouse, your parents will look at you and say, are you crazy that you want to live life like that? Are you crazy? You want to go and care about other people? Are you crazy? Shouldn't you, you, you be building up your own nest egg and, and, and be rich and be happy that way? Because the way of the cross is folly to the world. And just in case you look at this and say, oh, so poor thing, huh? all these Christians, they suffer in life. They live simple lifestyle. They don't have this. Uh, they don't have that. It's so poor thing. I always remember this lady, you know, uh, again, one of those ultra rich. I, I haven't, I'm not trying to condemn richness, but I must tell you honestly that I, I have some problems dealing with all this opulence, right? So we were having a dinner, uh, and she gave the treat to Dr. Tong actually. So, as his faithful translator, I get to go too, you know. So, like, we were slipping expensive shark fin kind of a thing. And so she asked, Hey, Elder Young, what do you do uh, in life? I said, Well, you know, uh, I help the poor. We, we build houses for some of them, and some of the poor people live in terrible conditions and all that. And so she was slipping on a shark fin, and she said, Oh, so charm, uh, so terrible. What should we do? Uh? It's so difficult, you know. Poor people. I was thinking to myself, hey, you don't eat the shark fin, uh, you can build a house, you know, from the, this is a first grade, it was not shark fin, sorry, bird nest, because it was dessert, bird nest, first grade bird nest, xie yan, which has blood inside, you know, the poor bird has blood, the xie yan, the highest grade, you know, so I know that everything that she eat, uh, I can probably build half a house there, but I, I ate too, to be honest, so, <laughs> <laughs> Is that what it's all about? Then you say, I put it, you get to eat all these things as Christian. Uh, you live life where you care for other people. You don't get to enjoy yourself. It's so tough. It's so difficult. It's like a monk kind of existence. It's just so stupid. The Apostle Paul reassures us in verse 25, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is a hyperbole a kind of exaggeration, of course. Of course, God is not foolish. What Paul is saying is that even the tiniest insignificant thought of God is stronger than all the wisdom of the world combined. And I'm very happy that I, I, I thought of this particular phrase because when, when you look at the verse, it's so difficult, right? You think about God and all that. This phrase that I keep repeating, I want you to remember. Simply God cannot possibly be wrong. Wrap your mind around that. That God cannot possibly be wrong. Can you, do you understand that? That He cannot possibly be wrong. 
everything he said cannot possibly be wrong. Cannot possibly be wrong. And uh, I tell you, it influenced me all my life just thinking about this. That everything he said cannot possibly be wrong. I was invited by Brother Budi to go to his house to bless uh, the, the impending, at that time it was impending wed wedding of Aryan and, and, and Leah. And I was uh, sharing from Matthew chapter 19. That Jesus Christ said that what God has put together, what's the next verse? Let men not separate. And I was reminding the young couple that can Jesus Christ be wrong? Can, can he make a mistake? Can he, he say something that, that he was not sure of and maybe he was just telling you something that is nice to hear? No, he cannot possibly be wrong. And so when you say I do to each other, Jesus Christ declared you have pledged yourself to each other and it is God who has put the two of you together. Therefore, you don't separate. And I was encouraging them from the anger. I was telling them that the one second before you say I do, you can still turn around and run. Still no count. The will of, the, the will of God is still not certain. The moment you say I do before God and man, Jesus Christ declared that God has put the two of you together. Do you believe this? Oh, I'm so happy that yesterday she didn't run. She still said I do. <laughs> if, if, if she run, then they will blame me. You are the one who tell me that, you know, that is you no know, count. And that's what the word of God means. God cannot possibly be wrong. And so, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when you look at God's truth, that makes sense, that work, not happy, seems to be weak, seems to be stupid. Guess who's wrong? Guess who has moved? Guess who has moved away from the truth? Because God cannot possibly be wrong. And so may the word of God this morning once again remind us that at the end of the day when we proclaim Jesus as Lord of our life, we are talking about Jesus crucified. The entire message of our life, of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, his teachings, his example, culminating to the crucifixion and the redemption of us all. Remember that when we call him Lord, it means that we believe in the word of God that teaches us that the power of the cross is clear to those who have been called but to the world it is foolishness may we decide to be foolish in the eyes of men but wise in the eyes of God let us pray we give you thanks O Lord for your word that continue to teach us in all this generation, that sometimes when we are confused about where to go, what to do, may we always be reminded that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. You cannot possibly be wrong. And so when we look at your way versus our way, may we be reminded always that your way will always seem foolish to the fallen world. You asking us to forgive our enemies, to love one another, to serve one another, to live a life where you are Lord in our life. It's such a, such a dumb thing to do as far as the world is concerned. Shouldn't we like try to show up our barnyard for ourselves, for our next generation? Shouldn't we use the latest management theory to gain as much as we can in the world? Shouldn't we follow our own thinking processes? It's always foolish if we are falling or if we are fallen away from you. But as the Apostle Paul says, to those of us who have been called by you, we will recognize your voice immediately. As Jesus Christ said, he is the great shepherd. His sheep will hear his voice and recognize his voice. Help us, O God, to hear your voice and to recognize it. For we are your people. What a great privilege it is to be called your people. But we are weak. Oftentimes we would rather follow the ways of the world than your ways. We would rather place faith in things that we can hold on to in our hands than faith in the invisible God. And so help us in our unbelief. Strengthen us. Teach us. Speak to us. And help us to heed your call that we may return to you and live life in the way that you have designed us to live. A life full of love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The marks of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. 
listen to our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.